Hi everybody, thank you very much for having me. I, um, as Frank has just said, I'm based in, I live, I, well I'm born and bred in West Yorkshire in the, what's known as a heavy woolen district in England and um, I'm very much looking forward to talking to you today. I'm really sorry I couldn't make it to Canada. I've been trying to make it for the, since early 2020 and obviously um, life keeps getting in the way. So um, I shouldn't be muted, I should be, can everybody, can anybody else not hear me? Um, my microphone is on as far as I know. Let me just have a look. Um, yeah, everything okay? People can hear me? Good. Excellent. Right. So, um, how I'll just share my slides. Bear with me. Um, share screen. There we go. Here we are. Can everyone see this? Is that the full presentation that you're getting? Always slow. And when 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 PowerPoint's fully woken up, don't know why it's doing that. Come on, come on. Don't know why the screen is not loading. Oh, there we go. There's the full slide. Hopefully, they're going to move forward fairly fairly smoothly. So yes, I say welcome to this presentation. It's it's such so flashing to be asked. Really exciting and a little bit nervous. I've never done never speak spoken to a Canadian conference before, but I do like talking to people. So so here we go. So yes, um, I wanted to talk about facilitating mutually beneficial conversations, because it seems to me that, well, I, I like talking to people anyway, as you'll see when I come onto my background a little bit, talking to people and learning new things and then telling other people about the new things is, is really the, the sort of the driving thing for my whole life and career, really. Um, so yes, it's thinking about how do we facilitate those mutually beneficial conversations when it comes to health data research, because it's such a, a technical thing and so often so difficult to describe to people and get them on board with. Um, and then think, well, how do we move forward from those conversations and put the points that we've raised into action? And, and I also thought, I'm, I came to the end of writing this presentation and then thought, you know, I've, I've asked you more questions than I feel I've answered, but feel free again to ask me about things and let's talk about some things and think about where we as a as a patient voice, um, a public voice are going with health age research and, and what we want it to do, um, both, both locally to us and internationally, you know, what are the things we all need to take forward together as, as, as humans, um, rather than as separate sections. So yeah, as, as Frank was saying, I, I I did not, I was not a researcher from birth, shall we say. Um, my first career was actually in local newspaper journalism. And um, then I, when I was expecting my third baby, I left that career because of childcare, basically, and I was bored. There you go. Um, and, and just, I got involved with a charity called the National Childbirth Trust. Um, because I didn't know anyone with a baby and it's a provided support for people with babies and um, and then just got more and more involved um, and there are lots of different strands to what NCT did as well it ran antenatal classes um, it ran postnatal support groups and it also had um, strands of work where um, members got involved with maternity research from, you know this is quite early in the whole um, patient and public involvement journey and also got involved in co-production improving maternity services um, so yeah, and I, I got involved with that. So that that first baby, that one on the top left, he was born in 1992, and and things have been going on ever since. And just to say, the picture at the bottom, um, if you can pick out my three that I gave birth to, well, good for you. Um, that is at a wedding earlier this year with three other boys, um, very good friends. So we kind of kind of extra sons, if you like, along the way, um, and and one of them has a baby. So that's it's all. I'm kind of in I'm in virtual grandmotherhood, even though I've not actually had a. A, a child of my body give birth to another baby but yeah there we go um but yes so there's been been this ongoing um involvement in maternity as well as working in various jobs to sort of fit things around my children um and i'm now now volunteering now is focused on breastfeeding peer support that's something i do locally um but i did went to university after i'd had my babies so i trained with nct as an antenatal teacher um, and then on the back of that training, I was offered a place to study psychology at Leeds, which is a local university to me. And I went on to do my master's in psychological approaches to health alongside teaching and classes and having the babies and doing other jobs. So it's it a bit full on, but that's how it went. And then as a following on from there, um, I was part of what NCT used to call its research network. And they put out a call on the research network to say, um, does anyone want to join this trial, the infant trial? We need a, we need a parent rep. 
and I shot my hand up because I was really interested in all the issues around CTG monitoring in labour. Um, and that was, it was very much a baptism of fire when it comes to um, PPI. Uh, it was a trial which recruited 48,000 women and babies over five years. And we think it took, we took nine years in total to set it up, um, recruit all the women, do all the analysis, write it up, have lots of arguments at the end about how we should write it up and so on. But it was it was an absolutely fabulous experience. And from then on, I got more and more involved um, with different types of research projects, joined NCT as a staff member, sort of helping to run all the um, involvement they had with different research projects. And then I've been a, a freelance um, consultant in what we call, well, people like me who work in mainly maternity call, we call it parents, patients and public involvement. So one of the big things for us always um, for years has been that um, people giving birth aren't patients because they're not ill in the main. Um, they are parents, they are mothers, they are fathers, they are women, they are men, but they're not patients. And, and, and that's a big, a big thing within, I say, within the maternity world. And just to add, I, I was one of the original members of Health Data Research UK's Public Advisory Board. I think it was set up five or six years ago. Um, and I, I say one of the first people involved when they, they set that board. And I'll, I'll come back onto that a little bit later. Um, and I just want to say a little bit more as well about the sort of landscape that I'm operating in. So I don't know, I don't know what sort of health interests you all have, but we certainly within maternity, we feel that the, the, the patient group we have is often, well, I'm sorry, I'm saying patient group, aren't I? The, the population group that we have is different often to other areas of health in that people are generally younger, they're still working. Um, they don't generally don't see birth as um, a pathological event. It's, it's a normal event. Even people who I speak to who've got two or more long-term health conditions, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit more later, but even those women, they, they, they want their birth to be seen as a normal event. Even if they need medical help, they're like, no, this is a normal life event. It's not, um, it's, it's not something abnormal, and we need to talk about it and think about it in that way. But there is this range, so there's, um, there are recent service user representatives who are usually very busy with small children, so quite limited in how much they can input but they're still interested and then there are still primarily women with older children who've just who've got very involved in this world and stay around um, but we do have this long history of co-production both in maternity services and in research the, the, co the maternity services one goes back to 1992 and possibly earlier and some of the research groups that I work with have been um, doing this for a long time as well as a, as a patient and public involvement thing but the other thing, and we always have to bear in mind as well, is that there's often um, conflicting goals between um, different parents. So there's always this ongoing debate about um, are you high risk, are you low risk? Should you aim for a spontaneous vaginal birth or is a medically managed birth a better thing? Even at the same time as we're saying it's a normal event. Um, you know, how do you feed your baby? How do you, just so many things, there's, there's often that take on it and you one of the things we have to be really careful about is that there isn't a particular voice that's dominant at any particular time. Sometimes it's swung towards the sort of what used to be called the normal birth um, voice, which isn't always helpful. So it's spontaneous vaginal birth, maybe a bit more of a better description. There's a, a lot of focus at the moment on the lost voice, people whose baby has died um, because of some of the inquiries that we've had in the UK. So there's, there's those swings and it's just trying to make sure that all the voices are heard to um, create a health conversation that's that represents all of us um, moving forward. Um, so yeah, that's, that's our landscape. Oh, and I should also add, there's often as well within um, the birth movement, there's often a great deal of scepticism about the input of um, pharmacological companies. There's they're just real um, reservations about their involvement in funding research or any anything to do with drugs or um, baby equipment or anything. There's just, there's just a real resistance to that quite often. So that's the sort of thing that we're working with. So when I'm when I'm doing projects, um, this is a really important thing. What I'm going to do in this presentation is um, I've got very I'm outlining a few of the different projects I've been involved with and the things that we've done, as I say, to to get those conversations going and then to think about how we action the results of those conversations. Um, but be, when this when this statement came out from the International Journal of Population Data Science, this was I thought this was brilliant because it really encapsulated what we've been trying to do with with the first project I got involved with that involved health data. Um, it's really useful. It kind of underpins a lot of what I'm doing. And and when I'm um, 
when I'm thinking about right yeah what am I doing where am I going with this how do we plan it how do we how do we think about our impact we're, we're often referring back to these points time and time again to say right yeah this is what we're aiming to achieve how do we do it where are we going with it um, and the one that I've found myself increasingly adding to this is that as I'm doing projects and I'm talking to people about projects, I'm having to help spend quite a lot of time helping people to understand how government and policy works. So trying to explain that journey from research question to actual um, impact into, into, into medical practice, for example, or into a clinical guideline or into you know, some sort of policy change, that, that's the thing that I have to spend quite a lot of time explaining. And it seems to be more acute with population data research than it is with, say, a randomised control trial, for example. So that's um, that's something I'll, I'll keep going back to again at the end. And and yeah, and these are the definitions that we that we work to in the UK. For, so the National Institute of Health Research did provide us these definitions after quite a lot of work. So we talk about involvement as when um, parents, patients and the public are involved in that, that more strategic level um, in the day-to-day -day running of a trial. Um, they, they're under NIHR guidance, they should always be offered payment for their involvement, whether they take that or not, and there's a, a standard pay scale. Um, and they're usually involved for the whole length of the project. They don't, they don't dip in and out. Um, or occasionally they're part of a department panel. You know, I do work some research panels that have a, a permanent panel that, that that talks about different trials at different times whereas engagement is the wider conversations it's um, and from my perspective it's me persuading researchers and data analysts to go out and talk to people um, about how they've done their work it's to write a blog in quite simple language about how what they're doing so I can share that with a wider audience um, and we can think also as well about well you know how do I prep them to go out and talk about that and, um, and say things about that and to cope with people's responses um, and, and try and think about you know how they how they make sense of that and how they make it into something workable for them. These are more likely one-off events, and we're very unlikely to offer payments. We have occasionally offered things like um, phone vouch, you know, data vouchers for, for um, internet access, but that's as that's just come about as we because of COVID, we've had to shift so much stuff online. So that's that's the sort of the, the basic difference between the two of them. So I have some general points that I want to touch on before I before I launch into the project generally, um, and and actually quite a lot of these came out of that conference that um, conference we were all out at last year. The um, let me see if I can remember it properly. The International Population Data Linkage Network Conference, which was I can't I, I think it's in is it in Chicago the next one Frank I can't remember. Um, it was a really good conference with an absolutely excellent. Um, thread of, of, of speakers about patient and public involvement in population data research. So well worth um, looking out if you get a chance to go to the next one. Um, and one of the things that we, you know, we kept talking about, we had these really good speakers from all around the world talking about different groups, different populations, um, um, and kept going back to it, kept kicking up in my head. If there's something in there that we need to all be thinking about as we're having these conversations, as we're doing this research, as we're talking about things, um, how much are we thinking about what, what I think of as a model citizen? So what's what's data capturing about us? What picture is it building about our lives? But at the same time, what's what's that data missing about how we live our lives? You know, is it only capturing us? Well, if it's if it's government data, it's only capturing us when we interact with with the government system or with a health system. So what else have we got going on in our lives that, that that big data picture just isn't capturing? Those things that we're doing to help us cope better, or maybe we're doing things that are actually impacting on our health in negative ways, but they're things that we do privately. So there's there's no record of that. So yeah, there's a lot of thinking there about, yeah, what are we capturing? What do we want people to capture? Where are we going? Um, and is that data capture and the coding and the legislation that lies underneath it, how much is that keeping up with how we live our lives? You know, what, what's changing within our lives? What's changing over a 5, 10, 20, 50 year picture? Um, and what, you know, we don't really seem to have any formal mechanisms in the UK that I come across where different groups come together and say, hang on a minute, this is happening. This is something that people are doing. Have we got it? How are we capturing it and coding? What are we doing? Um, and, and where are we going going forward? And we and we're constantly coming back to this thing of, so you know, I'll talk to a patient group, and they're especially if they've got a particular interest in an area of health or illness, they'll say, absolutely, we need all this extra data. We could do so much more if we had all this extra data. 
but then you go and talk to another group and they're like, mm, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. And I'm still, I'm still talking to people in the UK who haven't grasped that, you know, all their data is going into this system. They often haven't grasped that anyway. Even if they have grasped that their health data is being used and shared, they think they can opt out of individual studies um, and then opt back in, which, which really isn't that easy. Um, and people aren't aware that, I mean, extra complication in the UK, we have different legislation on um, our health data sharing between England and Scotland. So in England, yeah, the presumption is that it's shared, but you can choose to opt out. From the last thing I was told, in Scotland, you don't have that option. Um, it's assumed that, you know, it's all collected for the public good and you can't opt out. So there's there's all sorts of complications and people moving between areas and all that sort of thing and trying to think again about how are we explaining it and what are we doing going forward. Um, and, and, and again, one of the things, particular to us, you know, we're, we're generally seen as a nation at the UK where we have the National Health Service. So we have these huge data sets, but we're, as, as those of us who are living it are finding, the NHS is under a lot of pressure. It's the services are becoming a little bit more fragmented. Um, the various governments have said, well, we're going to commission a private company to provide this service. Or people just themselves think it's taking me so long to see this specialist. I'm going to go private. If I've got the money, I'm going to go private. And it's not always clear about how that data makes it back into our NHS records, um, either because the systems aren't set up or that quite possibly because some people think, I don't want my GP to know about that. That's a private thing. So it's it's thinking, mm, are we starting are we starting to get a bit more patchy? I don't honestly know. And I would I would like to have more of a conversation about this going forward. So the first um the first um what I'm going to talk to you about is the birth timing project. So I was not the PPI leading this. It was uh, my manager at the time, Mary Newburn, who's there on the top right, who's my manager at NCT. She was then head of research. So this was um this project got started in 2013. Again, fairly early days of um, health data research, um, funded by the ESRC, I believe. And um, so Mary and Miranda, who's there next to her, who were both you know, very involved entity over the years, and me working with them, we they set up this system for um, inputting into this project. So the project was linking um, birth data from health um, health hospital episode statistics, excuse me, from the NHS and for the um, birth registration data from the Office of National Statistics. And using the, that linkage to analyze, look at the timing of birth as well as the place of birth and see if those things had implications both for how those births progressed and the health outcomes for both the mother and her baby. Still haven't fully published it. Some some data did come out at the at the conference last year, but it, it's it's getting there. Um, so, but yes, yeah, so we set up the, the public involvement and engagement um, with this using NCT systems that we had in place that the, the, the charity just uh, just developed in in response to sort of a member need, if you like. So yeah, we had that standard um, study advisory panel. Um, of four fairly experienced service user representatives. And we also run um, a series of engagement workshops. So NCT again had this network for people who were involved in co-production and maternity services, who I have to say were all women. And um, we, so we ran this series. And so we talked about different parts of the project at different stages to get that wider sense check that people were happy with data being used in this way and, and with population data research generally. And that, that was a requirement of the funder that we had this sense check, that people were okay with what we were doing. Um, and we, we sort of, we got to the end of that project and we decided to write it up. And as we sat there and wrote it, you can see, you can see the uh, reference at the bottom there, we realized that what we'd actually developed without even thinking about it was a three-tiered approach, what we call the three-tier model. So it's that we have um, on that strategic level on tiers one and two, you've got experienced service user reps as co-investigators, you have recent service users forming an advisory group, and then tier three is when you're going out, you're doing your engagement, you're, you're talking to that wider um, audience, which I think is, it, I mean, you could do this in any sort of research, but I do think it's particularly important um, with population data research, given all that as assumed consent, you need to keep talking to people about what you're doing and how you're doing it. So they, they're aware and, and they're not feeling that they're being shut out maybe by the scientific community. So I'd say we wrote that paper up and then uh, Mary and Miranda moved on to new things. Um, we started birth timing two, which is looking 
we'd had some delays in getting the data on birth time one, so we got some more funding to continue it, and that project continued to look at things in more detail. Um, and so I moved on to take on uh, to lead on the, the public involvement engagement on this. And in with with great timing, this paper came out from Trish Greenalg and uh, and Co about some of the different frameworks for supporting um, involvement in this sort of um, work. And it was like, this is brilliant. This is absolutely what we need to be doing. This is what this this is what we're trying to do anyway. But this is giving us a great structure for saying, yeah, this is why we're doing it. This is important. All these things need to be there within um, health data research with this assumed consent element that we're thinking about respect and support and transparency, that we're being responsive to patient need and we're thinking about where we're going um, with that. So that we actually started, well, I started the, the public involvement engagement with this by going to what we now class a tier three event. So um, NCT had been withdrawn gradually from um, the sort of the whole um, maternity services co-production work. And another organization entirely user-led popped up called National Maternity Voices to support those people. Um, and they ran what they called an unconference. I don't know if anyone's ever been to one. It's basically, it's, it's a conference without an agenda. The agenda set when everyone gets there um, and I attended that I think it was the week before I went into lockdown or maybe two weeks before but but not much time basically um, we'd offered to fund some travel for delegates as well and in return um, the organizer said yeah absolutely you can come and join the list of people who will stand up at the front and pitch a session on your project and see if anyone wants to talk to you about it and some people fortunately did so you know I ran them through the results that we already had talked about what we wanted to do next and collected some names for that PPI advisory group um, but as we even as we were talking about the results on that day um, it became really clear that there was very limited public understanding at, at this stage remember this is, this is 2020 so not that long ago but very limited on public understanding about some of the limitations both the limitations and the possibilities of using um, health data in this way. They were asking me some really relevant questions about the, um, the health issues of, you know, the timing, timing of different births and saying things like, um, well, can you tell us about different grades of cesarean, you know, the, the, the amount of full-on emergency cesarean versus um, an unplanned cesarean, but, but no immediate um, risk to mother and baby health sort of thing um, and and we had to say well th that's a really great question but it's not one that we can answer with the data sets that we have so we got to put um, our public patient public involvement group together we have four members and we decided that the thing we would do would be um, introduce them to publicly available versions of um, some of the data sets we were using Certainly from the ONS, there's a lot of data from them. And there is, um, in the UK, we have something called Maternity Dashboard, which is, to some extent, accessible um, by service user representatives. They can they can look at trends in their area and so on, just to, to certain levels, to certain levels of granularity. Um, and we thought, right, we'll, we'll talk them through. We'll have a session, me and the data analyst, we will talk through, we'll, today we'll talk through some ONS data, tomorrow we'll talk through HES, tomorrow we'll talk through something else. Um, so we did this. We set up these meetings, we got started, myself and the data analyst, that was Lucy Carty, um, and we very quickly, very, very quickly realised um, that our group, as much as they were totally interested in maternity and data, now they weren't interested in learning about data sets from a methodology point of view, but they did have lots of interest in discussing it from the point of view of health topics. And, and we realised that that was, that was our way in um, to getting people engaged. Um, and the really hot topics that we came up with, well, well, you can see the top two there on the slide, um, miscarriage and ethnicity in particular are really key. And these are the ones that we, we keep talking about, myself and other people at different events. If you're thinking, yeah, miscarriage, this was, this was really important. One of our members in particular raised this, saying she was looking for more data on that. And we had to say, well, there isn't any really because miscarriage, it never makes it into health data records. It's not a routine data collection. It's not something your GP or your midwife really asks you about. Um, and it's something that happens to the vast majority of women in private at home. And you never you never go and see, you're, you very rarely go and see a doctor about it. If it's happened several times, then they might say to you, okay, we'll, we'll refer you on for investigation, but it's not until it's happened several times, at least, that they would do that. So you're thinking, yeah, this is a massive issue. 
This is hugely important to women and to their partners, actually, as well. It has a massive emotional impact, but it's not there in the population data. It's like it doesn't exist. It's just not there. So that's something that, you know, we, and I'm, I'm still going into meetings and I'm still saying, yeah, you're planning that, that's great, but where's your miscarriage data? You haven't got any. You've got to at least account for the fact that you we haven't got that on women. You can't say that it's women with a fine to do that. They could have had loads of miscarriages, but you, if you're just working with health data, you're missing a large part of women's reproductive health. And that's something we need to keep thinking about going forward. So the other major topic was ethnicity. Um, I don't know how much you're all aware, but we've um, within the UK, we have confidential inquiries um, which look at all the maternal deaths. Um, over a period and the the big finding in recent years has been that women who are black um, are five times more likely to die as a result of pregnancy birth or in the early postnatal period so that that finding's been it's it's hit the news all over the place it's you know it's it's gained a lot of interest and it's also triggered some some excellent campaigns to get this this issue you know really at the forefront the five times more campaign is run by black mothers um, and there are other groups as well of black mothers who are saying look you know our these are our care experiences they're really poor we need to think about that so that that data that collection of data has really helped them move their concerns forward but at the same time, we had a woman on our group who was, she was born abroad, but she's black British, um, which is citizen. And she was saying, well, from a personal point of view, that wasn't helping her. We could talk about, you know, if, you, if you're black, you're five times more likely to, to die. Um, and she's like, well, that, the last time she was pregnant, that was no help to her at all. It was just, it just seemed to be something that people used to scare her with. You know, you have to behave with this way. You have to have this test. You have to do that because you're five times more likely to die as a result of this pregnancy. And she said that nobody could give her any, nobody could break it down for her in any other way. They couldn't talk about, um, you know, where she was born. They couldn't talk about her diet or anything as a child. They couldn't talk about her education level. Um, they couldn't give a more precise ethnicity definition. They could just say, if you're black, this is what happens. Um, and, and that was something that was just, it was deeply um, disempowering for her and, and distressing. Um, and the issue of this ethnicity code, and again, we keep bringing it up and we keep bringing it up and we keep bringing it up. Um, and and it, again, it started because we're raising it in this way. Um, other people start to say things as well. And I have to say, I'm a little bit guilty in some, in some respects in that if I talk about people of South Asian descent, I assume that means people from India or Pakistan. Because where I live in the heavy wool district, we have... Um, a significant population who are descended from people who um, emigrated here from India or Pakistan to work in the textile trade. Um, and then I was in a meeting where someone went, no, no, hang on a minute, South Asian, that includes me and I'm from Sri Lanka. And there's now, you know, a sizable proportion of people in the UK who come here from Sri Lanka. Um, but and we're very different to people from Pakistan or India. So how are we going to break that down a little bit more? So the issue of ethnicity coding, what we're doing with that, is hopefully, I think, I believe that NHS England is doing more work on that and hopefully we're going to get more detail that, that's going to be able to help people a little bit more in that way. But it's, yeah, it's it's certainly, I think it's only because you think, right, these are key topics, we have to keep banging that drum. And if any meetings we get into, we go, excuse me, hang on a minute, have you thought about, have you thought about what you're missing? And have you thought about the fact that your data just isn't detailed enough to be helpful to people? It might give you a very crude overview from a, a sort of policy planning, population planning point of view. But if you're talking about health data, which people are funding, which they expect to be helpful to them, the coding you've got just isn't good enough. It's just not helping. So that's the thing. So we um, went on, we developed some guides, um, which we've shared with, with members of National Center Voices so they can start to think about, hopefully they can use data. Um, and we held an online launch event. We kept it very quiet. So we wanted to make sure that only service user representatives could get to it and we were going through a period where certainly it seemed that every other meeting I went to about um, public involvement and engagement and health data um, at least half the audience would be researchers going I don't know how to do it so can you tell me please and we didn't want that we wanted it to be about service users so we had that event um, and it went really really well and we got some excellent feedback there was um, myself the PPI group were there they presented um, we had we had a very small analysis team but they were all there um, and we just I say we just got some great feedback it was it was mind-blowing to researchers as well actually one of whom is an immensely experienced professor but he was so excited when we finished 
that he'd learned so many things from people that he'd seen this this data that he works on a regular basis actually take on kind of human form if you like um and you know he could he, could, he was picking up all kinds of things like i say the the the, the vaccine hesitancy and health data hesitancy thing was was one of the key things he flicked up and again they were they were really interested in this this thing about um data collection and i think that that wider audience they did say they got to it gave them an opportunity in this event to start to flag up again things that they're interested in saying look you're talking about research, you're doing some research, but you're not answering the questions that we're interested in um, about things like, you know, induction of labour is a massive issue here at the moment, um, long-term effects of birth interventions and so on. And, and just say, you know, where's the simple explanations of health coding? All this stuff's happening to our data, but we have no idea what it means. So that's another thing I keep, you know, waving my flag about as I go into various me meetings. So moving on, I'll take you around to one predict. So Mum Predict is, um, again, it's a health, mainly a health data project looking at women who have two or more long-term health conditions and um, the impact of pregnancy, birth and early parenthood on their health conditions and also the impact of their health conditions on their pregnancy and on their baby going forward. So really just I'm, I'm learning some absolutely fabulous stuff with this project, but we thought, well, we'll adopt that three-tier model. This here is our aim for... Um, public involvement and engagement with Mum Predict. Um, we, were, we were very keen that it was sensitive. I think the sensitive word kept coming out a lot because as we well, as we were already kind of aware, but it's come out more and more as we talked about this, there's so much sensitivity around women's health conditions and things that they feel that they're judged for just for having a health condition and so on. So we want to be really careful about how we presented that and, and get it out to lay audiences. Um, and, and this is the research goal to, you know, characterize and understand the determinants and consequences of multimobility in pregnant women and these predictive tools. Um, so we're doing a lot of data linkage. We've done some, there's, there's a whole interview thread, um, positive interview, and also some prediction modeling, which is, I yeah, I really need an idiot. If anyone's ever come across an idiot's guide to data modeling, please share it with me because I would I really need to know more about this. Um, but yeah, so moving forward, we we said, yeah, let's do three tiers again. So in the first, in our sort of pre-developed, in our development phase, we had a core PPI group of six members who all had two or more long-term health conditions. Um, and they presented at the launch event that we had that was that was multidisciplinary, open to all. But unfortunately, I wasn't there after having prepared people very carefully because I was in hospital with COVID, having virtually fallen off my chair in, in the preparatory meeting. Um, but they did a fantastic job. And you can, if you search for one predict, you can actually um, watch those recordings online as well and hear them and talk about their health conditions as well as some of the researchers talking about the work that we're doing. Um, but yes, yeah, so we, we got our funding for um, another three years and, and then it was right, sit down, let's really plan the public involvement and engagement because we have um, we have to cover in our PPI and E, um, 16 groups of health conditions. Um, certainly multimobility is slightly complicated by the fact there is no agreed definition of multimobility. So we have developed our own, which I say includes these 16 groups of health conditions. And we are looking at both physical and mental health. We're, we're including both of those things in here. And it's everything from relatively mild conditions, things like um, eczema and asthma, which, which may be annoying to people if in their worst state, but aren't necessarily life-threatening, up to the, the really serious things as well. Um, we wanted to represent all four countries of the UK because there are slightly different health systems in the four countries um, and we have universities from all four involved and we thought it was important to include um, the perspective of both rural and urban because what we're, when, when, and again, when we've got that, some data to support that, we talked to people and it's like, well, actually, yeah, how many women, uh, when they're pregnant and they've got two or more health conditions, are they seeing one specialist obstetrician who sort of covers everything or are they having to go to different hospitals sometimes at uh, different sides of the country in some cases um, to see you know someone who specializes in pregnancy and cardiovascular versus someone who specializes in cardiovascular and epilepsy for example um, and obviously we also want to cover um, ethnicity and culture and gender and sexuality in that as we were going forward so we expanded our um, public involvement group to we I think we're now up to 13 members although the some are more active than others. Um, let's say that they're, they're often quite busy having babies as well, which has caused people to move in and out. That's always an extra issue with maternity. Um, so yeah, I said we expanded that group and we said, right, our tier three will be um, often about going out and talking to um, different groups and actually focusing on either health conditions or population groups who 
are more difficult to to find or that they're seldom heard let's say in research um you know and we wanted to do you know we when we when we when we um, envisaged this we were thinking right this is my travel opportunity to go around the country and talk to different groups and then obviously we went into lockdown so um that didn't happen so um we've had to mainly shift to online but again it's an idea is that you know we're, we're talking to people at different points in the program we're getting that sense check that they think that they're happy with what we're doing we're answering their general questions about um what's happening with health data um and how we can you know use the data that we have to um, improve care um, and those are the sessions we've run so far um, LGBT Mummies is a charity in the UK um, we talk to a group of mental health peer supporters so there are various mental health peer support projects to um, link to pregnancy and birth um, around the UK so we, we picked some of those up the West Bromwich group is um, an area of Birmingham which is a, a more deprived population so we, we linked into a sort of a local project there um, refugees and asylum seekers were ones who lived in Yorkshire and the Humber which is which is my area, um, for our mental mothers, it's a really fabulous peer support project that works, I think it's based in the UK, but it actually works internationally, and they train um, women with HIV who are mothers to um, support other women who have got HIV and are becoming mothers, um, that's, they're doing some amazing work, they're well worth um, looking up. So I produced a standard slide set, excuse me, I produced a standard slide set or any team member to use, thinking it's going to be just like the birth timing project where my data analyst comes along every time, and actually found that with a big team, it's actually more difficult to do it, so it's me be doing all of it, although sometimes I've had a researcher with me as well. And, and we've just, again, we've got some really great stuff out of people then. We do have to really clear up to people that it's, you know, this isn't... Um, this isn't a this isn't an interview. This is you know this is more like a consultation opportunity. But they've they've generally enjoyed. They've always said well they've always said to us that they've enjoyed hearing more about what we're doing. Um, every every person and group we've talked to has said, wow, I hadn't realised that multimorbidity was so much of an issue. It really is an increasing issue both in the UK and around the world. So even the fact that we've raised that awareness feels like a big win for us. Um, and just we're picking up all the time these insights into the pressures and concerns associated with circumstances and health conditions and so on. And it, it just, again, keeps flagging up how much population data is missing about how people live their lives. Um, and you can see there's some of the examples. I mean, the mental health peer supporters in particular, they were talking about the fear that so many people have fear that they cover things up. Um, they're scared their baby's going to be taken away from them. Um, the, the asylum seekers said some of things about fear that they wouldn't bother reporting things to a GP. Um, because, well, partly because of language issues, um, you know, they, they didn't have the language to describe their symptoms, or, um, you know, they thought the GP just didn't understand they were coming from such a different take on health that they, they the miscommunication there was was total. And, and they were also very worried that if even them reporting things to their GP meant that maybe the home office would pick up on it and then say, well, you can't, you're not going to get settled status because you're ill. So they just they just weren't telling us telling their GP things. Um, they say they talk about this lack of understanding, and they talked about the you know the emotional financial costs of accessing both treatment and information. Um, a really lovely point that the asylum seeker group made was, um, will everybody please stop putting things on apps? They were really really clear about this. No more apps. Just give us the paper. And I think we we we're almost become a bit lazy about this, don't we? We think well everyone's got a smartphone. And actually, every, every asylum seeker in the UK has a smartphone. The government issues it with them because that's how they get their emails. But they have very limited um, a very limited data allowance. They have to go to somewhere like a library to access their apps, their internet, their data. So it's like, well, why are you giving me an app? Because I can't read it if I'm at home. I can only read it if I go to a public place. So you think, yeah, you just don't think about it. It's just so obvious because you're so settled and it's so easy seemingly to have your data and your contract. And you just think that this is such a massive thing for people. So we're doing lots of planning around dissemination and thinking about how we're going to get our results out in a sustainable way. But I think, again, we have to, at one point, our PPI group, less than work, they were saying, well, we should have an app that people can check. And you're like, eh, not necessarily as, as, as simple as you think, because there are an awful lot of women who wouldn't be able to, first of all, access that, but then quite possibly would struggle to understand the information that was contained in it because it could often get quite technical so yeah a huge thing do look out for more projects we as i said we do have a website and a blog and you can keep up with that if you're interested in this area um we're really looking forward to hearing to hearing more and and these are the this is the this is the sort of thing that i'm taking back into research meetings all the time and saying this is what people are telling us how are we answering things how are we building things in 
and and that, that miscarriage finding from from the birtarian project i'm flagging that up all the time in mum predict again because of some of the models that we're building and saying this is something we're missing how do we account for it how do we carry things through from one project to another is really important and not something necessarily that we would normally account for when we're looking at impact so the third thing I'm going to talk to you about is um, policy research unit. This is the Oxford unit that I work with. Um, the policy research unit um, for matern maternal and neonatal health and care is part of the National Perinatal Epidemiology Unit at Oxford um, in the Oxford Population Health Department. Um, and I've been working with them for a while and MPU has been doing um, patient and public involvement for, for many years. They were kind of a, a, a leader in this field in the UK that they, they'd started developing this list of, first of all, of organisations. Um, and myself and my co-lead, we've expanded it a lot more to include more organisations and more individuals as well who are interested in health. And, and most of the work they do is um, health data research. They use GP data sets, they use hospital epitome data sets and so on, um, to look at things and feed it back up to the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, and we wanted to do sessions where we, we, we put on something where people could learn, both talk about research in a relaxed way and learn more about this type of methodology. Um, so as when I, back in the days when I worked for NCT, I used to run um, critical appraisal skills program journal clubs for members, which apparently in itself was an unusual thing to do CAS with, um, with, with, a, with a lay audience. Um, and I really enjoyed that. And again, got some really interesting responses to people um, when we talked about different research. So I wanted to continue this with the policy research unit. So we, we launched it again during COVID. Um, so it's it's just one hour. It's done. And we, we just advertise it to our network. And it is this light touch. So we don't do the full cast thing anymore. we have done some other work with um, our list. And they'd said very clearly, yes, they wanted to learn more about research, but they didn't want it to be called research learning, shall we say. Um, so we just back that. So this is why we've called it talking about. Um, and we kind of follow a rough structure of the CASP, but only very rough. We um, we usually start with um, the researcher giving a really short presentation about a recent paper. Um, we'll have some sort of general discussion, um, but we always keep 20 to 30 minutes at the end for talking about um, the impact of these findings on your work with parents. And that is, I always find that to be a really um, important part of the CASP discussion generally um, and and they've generally been really productive we uh, we have we are learning lots of things through doing these um, we've had good interest in attendance we do find that people's background knowledge varies massively we always send them stuff out but um, I must I don't, maybe it's the same with all areas of health but certainly with maternity you run sessions on things and there's always a good section of your audience that says I haven't had time to read the paper tell me all about it um, hence the, the presentation that we started doing at the start. We, the thing that we do have to, to deal with with the, the talking about sessions is because we have organisational representatives there as well as individuals, um, sometimes people come with their campaigning hat on um, and sort of, if you're not really careful, they can kind of take up a lot of the conversation um, banging their strategy drum, if you like, um, because their organisation's got a strategy on a certain point. So we've had to be really clear about you know, giving everyone time to talk and um, you know, just, just monitoring yourself as well as other people. And we've also found we have to think a bit more about how we prepare and support researchers to come up with strong views and emotions. These are data intensive researchers. They often have little or nothing to do um, with the public audience. At least when you're talking to clinician researchers, they usually are quite used to dealing with members of the public. Um, data intensive researchers less so. So we, we, we've got to support that and, and be aware that they're often, they can feel attacked by people saying, this research isn't complete, it's missed something. So that's something to be really careful about. But again, we're, we're get, gathering lots of different perspectives on issues. Um, people have shared lots of insights um, on both topical and ongoing issues. You know, a big one is around the postnatal check that women in the UK have. I'm assuming, again, is this, a, is this an international thing? Don't actually know. But, but for years in the UK, it's been standard that when a woman has a baby, she sees her GP around six weeks afterwards for a kind of a kind of final sign off, if you like. Um, to check she's okay, to check her baby's okay. But the standard of this check had been dropping, it had been accidentally missed out of a, a GP contract some years ago. So some GPs had kept doing it, but others had looked at their contracts and thought, we're really busy, we don't have to do that, let's just drop it. Um, and so the Department of Health had asked um, the crew to have a check at how, um, how well that six week check was being carried out using a, a GP data set called CPRD Gold. 
Um, and really interestingly, when we talked about it in the session, one of the things the researcher flags up was there is no standard coding for a six week check, which is like, this is insane. The, the six week check has been happening in the UK for years and you're seriously telling me that no one has written a standard code for a six week postnatal check. So they'd had to do loads of work around um, trying to marry up birth dates um, with, you know, and then then counting forward and, um, you know, and looking for anything that might have happened in the GP records around that time that might possibly suggest that that woman had gone for a six week check. Um, so, yeah, getting lots of things coming out of there, but we're also getting lots of things um, coming up. You know, we get new research questions out of these that we can start to take to, back to Department of Health and Social Care and say, this is a thing that our, our patient audience is saying is really important and needs to be looked at further. You know, people are asking questions about this. Parents are asking questions about this. Um, but we don't have any evidence. What's, what's happening? This is what's happening on the ground. You know, you need to fund us to do more work on this. So, so that's, that's, it's been really, really valuable and looking forward to doing more of these going forward. So as we're doing all these things, you know, I'm kind of thinking all the time, you know, I'm one of those people, I'm very much, um, I heard them as described as, as we're horizon scanners. Some of you may be doing this, some of you may be very good at focusing, at whatever you're doing at the time. I'm not always that focused on what doing at the time, because so I'm always thinking ahead, but I'm always thinking about, well, what is my impact here? What am I doing? And going back to those original goals from that, um, from the, IJPDS statement. I think I feel that we are starting to do general. I am certainly with the work that I'm doing. I am doing more and more awareness raising. I am bridging some of that gap. You know, I have a colleague who says um, people like her and me. We should call ourselves knowledge intermediaries. We're not just PPI leads. We're, we know we're helping to translate between two audiences: the lay audience and the scientist audience. Um, and we're also bridging that gap between people and the data about them. We're helping them find out what data is there, helping them make sense of that data. We're helping establish that social license. Um, we're promoting, um, we're, we, we're putting stuff into place to um, help people feel more engaged with science. And, and I'll say that extra goal, helping people all the time to understand how government and policy works. But at the same time, I'm constantly thinking, well, yeah, but I know I'm doing this and I feel I'm getting somewhere, but what percentage of the population am I actually reaching? And what and the people I am reaching, what messages are they taking away to talk to all the people about? I'm still not entirely sure I'm being as clear as I could be on that one. Am I reaching enough people of different ages? Um, you know, and where's data intensive research? Where's that in education? It's not because from the discussions I've had with university lecturers, um, you know, doing data analysis, it's not. On, on you know these massive data sets, it's not in undergraduate education even for um, medical undergraduates, doctors, midwives, dentists, and so on. And and you know one of the complaints I regularly hear from the analysts is how um, that the, the code is not accurate, the code is not filled in properly, the records aren't complete. I think well actually if we could reach people at an undergraduate level at least with one module, they code better because they realise it was important. And we keep coming back to this thing, you know, what processes are needed for data collection and coding to keep up with social change? But we're constantly, you know, we're regularly raising issues and saying, what are we doing? Where are we going with this? These are issues that people are raising. What what's the what's the procedure for making sure that 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 changes that we're flagging up are actually being actioned? So my so the, the two examples that I have here are from my uh, Mum Predict PPI group. So as we were setting up the project and the PPI, the um, two things they realised is they were particularly interested in was making sure that um, transgender parents were represented, and that um, we looked at links with um, facility treatment. And they wanted to know if facility treatment was more was more common, um, for example, in people with with multimorbidity. Um, and on both of those, we've kind of drawn a blank, but for different reasons. Um, we, we discussed these at research meetings and the research said, well, we don't have coding in the UK for transgenderism, so we can't actually look at it very effectively. Plus, there's the issue that their understanding was that quite a few of the people who, who were having treatment um, were quite possibly doing it privately, and that wasn't always making it back into their NHS record. And we keep raising it with, with them. And it's England Department of Health and saying, you know, uh, have you got this yet? Have you got it? You know, because people keep asking us about this. And the last I heard, they were just said they were they were caught up in some legal issues around definitions. So we've, we're still not getting there. You know, this is something that people are doing, but we're not capturing it very effectively. 
and and on the fertility treatment thing well now that that data is captured you know the um even when the um, nhs has um contracted out a fertility treatment to private providers it, there's a lot of legislation around it and they have to submit that data to the human fertilization and embryology authority you know it's, it's that's really tightly controlled but at the same time the legislation that puts that into place well that was that was enacted well before we started doing um, health data research and um, it's really difficult for researchers it's even more difficult for researchers to get that data than it is for them to get um, normal health data sets so it would have to be a kind of separately funded project um, rather than, than part of the project that we had going on. Um, so it's it kind of, yeah, it's one of those things again, you know, what's happening, what's happening, what's happening in private healthcare? Is it always making it back into that public record? And how much are we losing as, as things like the NHS become more fragmented? How much are we losing on dentistry, for example? Much of um, adult dentistry in the UK is now by a private provider. Um, there are, and in some areas, there are. There's very, very little NHS dentistry capacity to the extent that you, we occasionally have, um, like, emergency vans come in and park in the town centre for people who have no dentistry access and have massive problems to go and get some emergency treatment. So, yeah, there's there's something. There's always that thing of you know, what's happening? What's happening within people's lives? What's happening within um, the the healthcare service? what's happening within within all kinds of things that's influencing those movements you know our our as our lives move through as we move through our lives how are we how are we capturing sufficiently and how are we accounting for changes over time and yeah when we keep coming back to this thing you know how do we teach people to balance data against anecdote it's constant thing you know you anybody who works in infant feeding support will tell you but every time you talk about um health benefits of breastfeeding for example someone you are guaranteed will pop up going yeah but i was bottle fed i was fed wheat from two weeks old and i'm just fine well maybe you are but lots of people aren't but it's very difficult to say people that when it's a when it's a daily held belief shall we say um so we yeah, just keep thinking about impact and where we're going with impact what we do with impact and how we capture impact um we start to think, I've started to think a little bit about this, you know, we, we talk about it being personal and local as well as national. We, I'm, I'm starting to try and prod people a little bit to say, um, how can groups and organisations use your expertise? Um, you know, how, how do we make things feel, how do we make people feel like they've got, a, what's the word? How do we make people feel like they've got some sort of contribution, that they've got some kind of, you know, they've got some agency around health data as well. And, and I'm constantly saying to researchers, you know, are you planning your impact and dissemination from the start? I can say to researchers, I know that you plan certain things from the start because I've seen you do dummy tables for your stats. Why aren't you doing dummy press releases? Um, it's it's the same thing. You've got to think about this. Where are you going with this? You can't just say project's over, I've got the results done. That's not part of the um, that whole social license beyond data capture. But then, so if I wanted to come on to this final thing. You know, a, a lot of what I do is I say working on individual projects and nudging researchers and talking to people. But I, as I said, I did join the Health Data Research Public Advisory Board. Um, it's fair to say it took us a little while to figure out what we were doing and where we were going. Um, HDR UK were very good about consulting us about different things they had going on. But sometimes it was like we're being consulted about so much stuff, we never got to work out what we wanted to achieve as a group. Um, and we were all used to work as individuals within within research teams, if you like, as well. But we did start to get to get get things together, um, and that link is to a blog that um, we wrote. So we um, we were thinking about data access committees, you know, part of the whole governance of managing health data within the UK, and we did come together to develop a survey which Health Data Research sent out to all the members of the Data Alliance um, to ask them how they were enacting different things, how they were involving people in their processes. And we you know, we found out about this range, um, some some very good practice, but also some, um, I wouldn't say poor practice, because it was a very, very, very start of, of this journey, if you like, for some of them. They were very early and they're not really giving it much thought at all. But we, we, we did that and through through continuing conversations again, this is, it keeps coming back to these conversations. We had conversations as a group. We talked to HDI UK, they talked to the Data Alliance. We, we shaped that survey together. Um, we presented it to the Alliance, they sent it out to their members and we got that great feedback. 
um, which then HDA UK and the Alliance committed to doing every year or two to see how that was progressing. And I'm just in the process of chasing them up to say, you know, where's it? Up? I'm not on that board anymore, but it'd be good to know where they're getting up to. What's the further reporting? Because yeah, how how we how we're involved in governments, it's it's, it's easy to get involved just in the research projects. They can take up all your time and effort. But I think certainly as um, I don't know, some people. Well, you have described as a researcher, Frank, which I thank you. But I'm kind of this, you know, this in between person balancing you know a foot on two stools if you like um and thinking well, well those of us who are balancing those stools if when we come together we're lots of small pebbles but throw us in a pond and we can make a mighty big wave when we work together when we have those conversations and we think about where we're going so this this is the end of my talk but i would really like to hear um any more you have to say about this it will be good to know i say i feel like i've asked as many questions as i've tried to answer but i'd like to know what you think about all of this so please do ask more questions Thank you.